Hey, can you hear me? Yeah? Okay. Okay, so the next speaker is Eric Crockett from the Georgia Tech and University of uh, Michigan. Hello. Uh, I'm going to tell you about uh, Lambda Compose Lambda, a functional library for lattice cryptography. Uh, this is a joint work with my PhD advisor, uh, Chris Pikert, from the University of Michigan. The name of our library refers to the combination of lattices, uh, which are denoted by capital lambda, and functional programming, which is associated with lowercase lambda. Uh, this name's a little bit hard to say, so instead we refer to it by its LaTeX acronym, LOL. So lattice crypto systems derive their security from hard problems on lattices. And a lattice is a periodic infinite grid like the one pictured here, except that in cryptography, we use lattices with hundreds or even thousands of dimensions. So lattice schemes have three main advantages. First, uh, they're efficient and embarrassingly parallel. Second, they're apparently secure against attacks from quantum computers. And this is in contrast to uh, crypto systems like RSA and Diffie-Hellman and anything else that re relies on factoring or discrete logarithms uh, because these can be broken by quantum computers. Finally, they can enjoy security from worst case hardness assumptions. So what this means is uh, to break a crypto system that relies on a random uh, instance of a problem, the attacker has to be able to break every instance of a related hard lattice problem. Crypto systems that directly uh, rely on lattices tend to have large secret keys and large ciphertexts. But if we use lattices with additional algebraic structure arising from cyclotomic rings, then we can get much smaller keys and ciphertexts. So our library, LOL, focuses exclusively on the ring variants of lattice crypto systems. Lattice cryptography has proven to be uh, very flexible and can be used to build a diverse set of cryptographic constructions. Some of these, like pseudorandom functions, digital signatures, key exchange, and collision-resistant hash functions can be built with many types of cryptography. Uh, but other applications, like attribute-based encryption for arbitrary access functions and fully homomorphic encryption, which allows arbitrary computation on encrypted data, have only been realized with lattices. So there are several existing implementations of lattice uh, crypto systems including the collision-resistant hash function uh, SWIFT by Lubashevsky et al. in Fast Software Encryption 08, uh, the digital signature scheme Bliss by Duka et al. in Crypto 13, uh, a series of key exchange implementations, first by uh, Bose et al. in Security and Privacy 15, and then by Alchem et al. in uh, Security, uh, Usenix 16, and then most recently by Bose et al. in uh, CCS 16. So you'll hear that in a minute. Uh, there's also an implementation of homomorphic encryption called HELib by Halevi and Shoup in uh, Crypto 14 and EuroCrypt 2015. So each of these uh, focuses on a single crypto system, and they're also uh, targeted for performance. And they really do get good performance uh, by using a low-level language like C or C++. Um, However, uh, that since implementations are tailored to a specific task, uh, they have few abstractions, and it would be very difficult to repurpose the code from these libraries to make other applications. However, all of those applications and most other lattice crypto systems can be constructed from just a few mathematical objects and operations. So we refer to these as the genes of lattice cryptography, and they include cyclotomic rings, Gaussian sampling, gadget operations, and matrix arithmetic. And these genes can be combined in different ways to create a variety of crypto systems. If you combine them in one way, you get pseudorandom functions. In another way, you get fully homomorphic encryption. So what would be nice is a library that implements uh, the lattice cryptography genes that we can then use to build any lattice crypto system. So this is what exactly what our library does. LOL is written in Haskell, a functional programming language with strong static typing. 
Uh, and there are five aspects that distinguish LOL from previous implementations. So first, uh, we actually implement interfaces for the lattice cryptography genes, so they can be modularly combined into any uh, lattice crypto system. We also implement sampling from the theory recommended uh, probability distributions so that we can capture the worst case hardness guarantees. And we also um, implement fast algorithms for arbitrary cyclotomic rings, which has practical performance advantages, which we'll see in a little bit. Uh, one advantage of using Haskell to implement this library is that uh, the language itself aids in the correct implementation of complex lattice crypto systems. So Haskell's last lack of side effects makes code easier to reason about, and its type system catches many uh, programming errors at compile time. And in particular, LOL uses the type system to enforce mathematical constraints uh, imposed by the crypto systems. We'll see examples of that too. So LOL has the first, is the first lattice crypto implementation to our knowledge uh, that exposes the hierarchy of cyclotomic rings, which enables novel applications like ring switching for a fully homomorphic encryption. And finally, the interfaces of LOL are designed so that code implementing a crypto system closely matches the mathematical definition of that crypto system. For the rest of this talk, I'll discuss the architecture and design of LOL. I'll show you how we can use LOL to implement uh, fully homomorphic encryption. I'll compare it to an existing implementation, and then I'll talk about what we're working on next. So LOL is designed in several layers, and at the top, uh, whoops, is the cryptography layer, which contains all the implementations of lattice schemes. The applications are built using uh, the lattice genes, which are exposed as an interface at the cyclotomic layer of our library. If you call, recall from biology, uh, a gene is just a sequence of DNA. And in the same way, the cyclotomic layer is just a thin wrapper around the tensor layer of the library, which exposes the computational backend. And the interface uh, for tensor includes linear transformations with fast, sparse decompositions. The most indivisible components of the DNA are, of course, nucleotides. And similarly, the integer layer of LOL exposes primitive lattice crypto objects and operations, like integer module arithmetic and integer gadgets. So I won't have time to talk about that layer, but I will talk about the other three. So first, to give an idea of the flexibility of LOL, we've implemented uh, several diff very different uh, types of lattice crypto systems. So we have fully homomorphic encryption with PAC ciphertext, key homomorphic pseudorandom functions, and actively secure encryption. And we also recently re released uh, cryptanalytic challenges for the ring learning with errors and ring learning with rounding problems on which most ring-based crypto systems rely. So before we talk about the next layer, uh, I need to give you a little more background on cyclotomic rings. So cyclotomic rings are defined by a cyclotomic index, and uh, that means that there's exactly one cyclotomic ring for every positive integer m. The ring operations are defined by the factorization of this index, and that's because, for example, the ring for m equals six is in some sense the product of the m equals two and m equals three rings. Uh, Inter-ring operations that involve cyclotomic rings with different indices have constraints requiring, for example, one index to divide another index, or for one index to be the greatest common divisor of two other indices. And with LOL, we're able to enforce these kind of constraints at compile time to catch errors early and help with correct implementations. Uh, so since ring-based crypto systems directly use cyclotomic rings, we need to be able to represent this in code. And the type SICMR represents the nth cyclotomic ring over the base ring R. Concretely, if we want to represent the nth cyclotomic ring over the integers, we can use SICMINT, where int is representing uh, the integer ring, and the ring of integers, and then m is a, a type representing the index. By changing out the base ring parameter uh, to representation of integers mod q, we can get a type representing a cyclotomic ring mod q. So this is uh, demonstrating the modularity here. By just changing the base ring, we get, a new we get a different cyclotomic ring. There are many different representations of cyclotomic ring elements, and LOL uh, implements the three most common uh, representations that are used in lattice cryptography. And many operations require the inputs to be in a specific representation. So if you want to do efficient, 
uh, ring multiplication, the inputs have to be in Chinese remainder representation, for example. In order to reduce the programmer burden and minimize the gap between code and math descriptions, the SIC data type uh, hides and manages the internal representation of ring elements so that the programmer never has to explicitly convert representations. So let's see how we can actually write some code. Uh, here we have, this is, this is Haskell, by the way. Uh, <laughs> X here is an element of the 15th cyclotomic ring mod 31. And mulg and lift pow are two operations from the cyclotomic interface. So mulg multiplies the input by a special ring element G. And lift pow uh, lifts a ring element over the integers mod Q to its smallest integer representative in the powerful, powerful representation. Uh, so it goes from Z Q, basically a cyclotomic ring over Z Q to a cyclotomic ring over the integers. And then uh, we can write an expression like this where we add and multiply ring elements and then multiply the result by the special ring element G and then lift it over the integers. As a second example in Haskell, for any additive group A, we can define a plus operator that takes two group elements and produces a third element of the same group. So if we try to add uh, X and W, where W is in the fifth cyclotomic ring, then the compiler tells us, actually, you can't do that because the fifth cyclotomic ring is not the same as the 15th cyclotomic ring, and the type of the plus operator requires that they're the same thing. In small examples, this isn't very helpful, but in larger examples, it's really useful to have the compiler be able to tell you this kind of thing. Um, one fun fact about cyclotomic rings is that when m divides m prime, the mth cyclotomic ring is a subring of the m prime cyclotomic ring. So this is captured by the embed function here, which requires the type index for m divides the type index for m prime, and uh, then it, it takes an input in the subring and produces an input in the an output in the larger ring. So then, if we Im simply embed w from the fifth cyclotomic ring to the fifteenth cyclotomic ring then we can add the result. And if we try to do that with an element uh, z, which lives in the sixth cyclotomic ring, then the compiler tells us that six does not divide 15, so we can't embed from the sixth cyclotomic ring to the 15th cyclotomic ring. As I mentioned, uh, the cyclotomic layer is a thin wrapper around the tensor layer, and that's because LOL represents ring elements as a tensor, which is an array of coefficients over a base ring. The tensor interface exposes linear transformations corresponding to ring operations. So to perform a ring operation, we just apply the appropriate linear transform over the underlying tensor. These linear transformations all have sparse decompositions, uh, many of which are given in the toolkit paper by uh, Lubachevsky, Pikert, and Regev in Eurocrypt 13. But one of our contributions in this work is to extend this collection of sparse decompositions to include inner ring operations. So see the paper for more details and uh, a complete list of, of all the uh, sparse decompositions we give. So we have multiple implementations of the tensor interface, one in uh, C++, one in parallel Haskell, and then we're working on one right now for graphics processors. Due to LOL's modular design, uh, applications written with LOL are completely agnostic to the tensor implementation, so it's trivial to swap out uh, the computational backends. We can, go from a program running with a C++ backend to, uh, and just make it run on GPUs, and it's very easy to do that. Okay, next I'm going to talk about how we can implement fully homomorphic encryption with LOL. So I'm gonna do an example um, of a simple version of a crypto system introduced by Burkursky and Vikernuthan in crypto 2011. So in that scheme, uh, plain text is an element of the mth cyclotomic ring mod p, again represented by the type sic m z q p here. A secret key is uh, in the mth cyclotomic ring over the integers. And a ciphertext is a polynomial where each coefficient is in the mth cyclotomic ring mod q. So that's represented by the type ct m p q. Uh, which internally is a polynomial with coefficients from the m cyclotomic ring mod q. And the p here does in fact representation. You see it doesn't appear on the right-hand side. However, it, it's there to uh, sort of enforce type safety and remind us that the plaintext value is mod p. So to encrypt a message in this scheme, uh, mu and rp under a secret key s and r, we first sample an error term, 
from a special distribution. Uh, then we sample a uniformly random element in R mod Q, and then we output uh, this ciphertext here. I wanted to please notice that uh, S lives in the ring R on the very top right, and uh, C1 lives in R mod Q. But we're multiplying, so we have, I wrote uh, S times C1. So this is actually implicitly module multiplication rather than ring multiplication. And that becomes explicit in the code. And then E here is also in the ring R, and then we're taking an element of R minus an element of R mod Q. So actually there's an implicit reduction mod Q happening in the math. So in the code, we can write an, an optional uh, signature for encrypt, which tells us that the first uh, input is over the, in the imp cycle homing ring over the integers, so that's the secret key. And the second input is uh, zp CQP, so that's in the imp cycle homing ring mod P, that's the plain text, and the output is the cipher text. So in the actual implementation, you can see that it's gonna match uh, the description very closely. The first thing we do is sample an error term from the special distribution. Then we sample a uniformly random element, and then we output a ciphertext polynomial, where we, uh, the star arrow here indicates module multiplication, and then we have to explicitly reduce E, and both of those things are just kind of implicit in the mathematical notation. Another interesting operation for FHE is homomorphic multiplication. So if we have ciphertext C1 and C2 encrypting mu1 and mu2, then we can get an encryption of the product, mu1 times mu2, by uh, multiplying the ciphertext polynomials, so C1 of S times C2 of S using polynomial multiplication, and then multiplying by the special ring element G. Now, uh, once again, this is actually module multiplication because G lives in a cyclotomic ring, but C1 and C2 are, pol are uh, polynomials over that ring. So just like with the additive group, for any ring A, we can define the star operator that takes two ring elements and produces a third ring element. So we can uh, define that for ciphertext by uh, just taking the two polynomials and then we multiply them. So C1 times C2 on the very right, that's using polynomial multiplication. And then we do module multiplication to multiply each coefficient of the resulting polynomial by the special element G. So that's the uh, bracket dollar there for module multiplication. I also want to talk about uh, ring switching. So LOL has the first implementation, oh sorry, ring switching is uh, a fast way to homomorphically apply a linear function uh, to a plain text by changing the ring. This has been done on paper before, but it's never been implemented. So we implement uh, two of the pieces we need to do it first, which is twice and embed, which is needed for uh, ring hopping, which is a version of ring switching. And then we also give an improved version of ring, we also implement an improved version of ring uh, hopping called ring tunneling. So the difference between ring hopping and ring tunneling is if you wanna switch from the ring H0 to the ring H1, uh, ring hopping hops over and goes through a larger ring T, T1, and then uh, it comes back down to H1, whereas tunneling sort of goes through instead the smaller ring E1 and back up to H1. So ring operations are uh, faster in the smaller ring, and so we get efficiency gains by going through, by going down instead of up. So this is why it's tunneling instead of hopping. Um, the indices of E1 and T1, psychotomic indices, are related to the indices of H0 and H1 by greatest common divisor and least common multiple. So this introduces some pretty complex constraints on all the psychotomic indices, um, and we can enforce all these with the type system. Okay, next I'm gonna talk about performance and evaluation of LOL, but first there's an important caveat, which is that we compare LOL to HELib, uh, which is the closest implementation in terms of functionality but the two projects have very different goals and executions. So for example, LOL is a general purpose framework while HELib is specific to homomorphic encryption. LOL uh, has high level interfaces for the lattice genes while the authors of HELib describe it as an assembly language for homomorphic encryption. And LOL is in a high level language whilst HELib is in a low level language. So these two approaches uh, offer very different trade-offs and we wanna quantify them by 
comparing code quality and complexity, as well as runtime performance. So, uh, for example, if we find that we can write applications in LOL with 10 times less code, but uh, runtime is 1,000 times greater than HELib, that's not very useful, probably. But if we find that LOL has better code and safety and usability while offering comparable performance, then it might be a good choice for other implementations. So first we're gonna look at uh, lines of code. LOL and HELib can both be divided into a library component and a computational backend component. So in HELib, the computational backend is Shoop's number three library, NTL. This is a big library with a lot of functionality, and so for this uh, comparison, we've actually stripped out all the, all the portion of NTL that's not needed by HELib. Uh, in LOL, the computational backend is the tensor implementation, and the closest thing that we could get to NTL is our C++ implementation. So that's what we're comparing with here. Now, if you look at the number of lines of code uh, for the computational backend and the library component, you see that LOL has about seven times less code than HELib. Uh, and do keep in mind that we have seven times less code and support a much, we have a huge collection of applications that we support, not just homomorphic encryption. So we have a lot less code, but is it better code? Well, one metric of code quality is cyclomatic complexity, which measures the number of execution paths through a function. So the idea is that fewer, uh, fewer execution paths means a simpler function, which is e easier to understand and reason about, and hopefully gives you more confidence in the correctness of the implementation of that function. On the other hand, more execution paths through a function indicates a more complex function, and you have correspondingly less confidence in correctness. And the graph here counts uh, the number of functions with a particular cyclomatic complexity in HELib and LOL. So LOL is the red and blue bars, and the HELib is the green and yellow bars. First thing you see is that LOL has a lot fewer functions for every uh, cyclomatic complexity. And this is in part because we have seven times less code. But the more important part of this graph is actually the, the size of the tail. So for HELib, there are a lot more functions. The tail's a lot longer, and there are a lot more functions out of the tail. And in particular, there are 41 very complex functions in HELib, uh, sort of at, at the end of the table there, whereas LOL only has five of these functions. So this indicates that, at least by this metric, functions in LOL are simpler than HELib, and uh, hopefully that corresponds to being easier to understand. I wanna talk about uh, performance next. So this table shows um, run times in milliseconds, microseconds, sorry, for common ring operations. The most expensive operation in, in uh, both libraries is the Chinese remainder transform, or CRT. Uh, for that operation in particular, HELib is highly optimized for power of two rings, so that's rings where the index is a power of two. And uh, they're about 10 times faster, HELib is 10 times faster than LOL in that case. However, some applications like ring switching require non-power of two cyclotomic rings. And our theory-friendly representation results in LOL being two times faster for non-power of two cyclotomic rings. Um, Another uh, operation that's common is component-wise vector multiplication. And uh, across the board there, HELib beats LOL by about a factor of four. However, we have a, an idea of how we can improve this and uh, hopefully get a little bit closer to HELib. So overall, this shows that performance is kind of mixed. It's not, it's not terrible. We're not that much worse than HELib and we're even faster in some cases. And I do wanna point out that um, since we have this modular design and lots of computational backends, we could in theory sort of integrate some of the awesome performance of HELib into LOL and get that performance in LOL. Um, I think I'm gonna skip this table for now, but I do wanna mention the time for ring tunneling since we have the first implementation of uh, ring switching. So for a typical ciphertext, that takes about 40 milliseconds per modulus. Uh, and for the other operations, common uh, homomorphic encryption operations, we're at like less than 10 milliseconds, which is pretty good, um, and we think it could even be better than that. 
Uh, finally, I want to tell you what we're working on next. So fully homomorphic um, encryption is a powerful application, but it's really hard to use. It has lots of parameters, and you have to periodically do key and noise management operations when you're doing a homomorphic computation. So this means that there's a lot of auxiliary information, uh, like keys and key switch hints, and it leads to complex homomorphic algorithms, like this one. For, uh, to compute a simple, a simple thing like x times x plus one, you could use this abstract syntax tree on the left, but if you want to do that for an encrypted input x, you have to use the syntax tree on the right, and uh, this is what the, sort of naively the programmer would have to write uh, that entire syntax tree. They have to manage the keys and the hints and add the other operations. So this complicates the process of using uh, fully homomorphic encryption, and we'd like to simplify that by using a domain-specific language to express the plain text computation. So the programmer writes this computation, and then uh, they can compile that description into a computation that works on encrypted inputs. So the compiler automates the production and sharing of hints and keys, and also inserts these auxiliary, these extra nodes like key switch and mod switch. Uh, this should make homomorphic encryption more accessible to a wider audience. So that's all I've got right now. You can find our code on GitHub um, or on the, hackage, the Haskell package distribution system uh, hackage. So thank you. One of the earlier slides you mentioned bootstrapping. Can you say a few words? I'm, I'm sorry. In one of the earlier slides you mentioned bootstrapping. Can you say a few words? Uh, if I said, did I say bootstrapping? I, I hope I didn't say bootstrapping. I thought, but I thought there was uh, something that said bootstrapping in the actual presentation. Uh, let's see. Well, uh, bootstrapping is a, is a part of homomorphic encryption that you need to do fully homomorphic encryption. Oh, I see. Um, I probably know what you're talking about here. So. Uh, right here. Oh, I did say bootstrapping. Look at that. Um, <laughs> okay, so bootstrapping is this way that uh, when you have a, a ciphertext and you do some homomorphic operations on it, uh, the noise in that ciphertext grows, and eventually the noise grows so big that you can no longer decrypt the ciphertext. So bootstrapping is uh, a way to refresh the noise down to like very small noise again so that you can do more more operations, and um, uh, there, so you can do bootstrapping where you sort of have to recrypt every single bit of a ciphertext, or you can pack a bunch of bits together and do it all at once, and that's that's what we are able to do. Um, yes, yeah. So I mean. Uh, we, we, didn't, we didn't measure anything like that yet. Sorry. <laughs> Please introduce yourself. Hi, Paul Grubbs. Um, when, you, when you talk about the, the number of lines of code of NTL, are you referring, like, so like NTL has like a native integer backend, and then they also have GMP as an alternate. Are you measuring like the native? Well, like, which one of those are you measuring? In terms well, of I, I don't remember anymore, but what we did is we took NTL and it deleted all the files that were not needed for HELib. So if it, if it wasn't called by HELib, it's not counted. And everything else, uh, I, I, I believe. The question is without. Yeah, yeah. yeah.